Hi, my name is Pamela Scholzvik. Uh, I started the Quarantine Book Club on March 14th. Um, and I am not a public speaker, <laughs> but um, I am so happy to be here. Um, I want to start off by saying a big thank you to uh, Quay Mai, who has agreed to do this. She's the first author. And all right, people can see us, yay. Um, and also, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get everything correct. Um, so bear with me. Today's live event is hosted by Amy and Nancy Harrington, sisters who founded the Passionistas Project to inspire women to follow their passions. Their podcast, the Passionistas Project podcast, features interviews with a diverse group of women from celebrity chef Susan Feniger to artist Lynn Evola, who melts down nuclear weapons to make peace angel sculptures. They have a quarterly subscription box called the Passionistas Project Pack filled with products from women-owned businesses and female artisans. And they host their own Facebook Live events in the Passionistas Project Facebook group. You can follow them there and go to their website, thepassionistasproject.com, to learn more. Um, as I said, my name is Pamela Scholzvik, and today I'm thrilled to have Kwe Mai to, um, joining us. Um, she was born into the Vietnam War in 1973. She grew up witnessing the war's devastation and its aftermath. She worked as a street seller and rice farmer before winning a scholarship to attend university in Australia. She is the author of eight books of poetry, fiction and nonfiction, published in Vietnamese, and her writing has been translated and published in more than 10 countries, most recently in Norton's Inheriting the War Anthology. She has been honored with many awards, including the Poetry of the Year 2010 Award from the Hanoi Writers Association, as well as many grants and fellowships. Married to a European diplomat, Kwe Mai is currently living in Jakarta with her two teenage children, but I know she is actually right now in Munich, Germany. So can we bring Kwe Mai into the conversation? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Pamela. So, thank you so much for having me on, on this uh, book club. Um, it's a lifesaver for me. The past few weeks have been so hard, uh, so emotional, so dramatic, and um, I see the light of hope um, in this group. Every day I, I wake up and I see people's um, comments or pictures, and it really lifts me up, you know. Thank you so much, everyone, for reading my book. Um, it means so much to me. You know, I worked on it for seven years, and it's a, uh, it's a work of uh, a lifetime research. And, uh, and I, you know, I didn't feel like I should go out there and promote it because there are now at the moment there are so many things which are critical to people's life. But I also realized that at the moment, you know, if literature can really help us. And I'm thankful that you let my book uh, keep your company during this uh, this very difficult difficult time. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for agreeing to be this. I mean, I had no idea. When I started this group, I was in a 2020 debut author group because mm -hmm. I have a book coming out in November. And I saw all these people having to cancel their events. And I'm like, well, I'll just start a, I'll start a book club. And, <laughs> and I wanted to pick a book that was going to be released a couple, in a couple of days. And that just happened to be your book. So we pick your book and then I'm like, oh my gosh, your book has been <laughs> reviewed positively in the New York times and NPR. You were in Oprah magazine. So you were getting so much praise for your writing. So how does that feel? I'm, I feel like I'm in a dream and I haven't woken up from it, you know, because um, when I was little, I always wanted to be a writer. And my parents told me, no, don't be a writer. You know, haven't you seen the experiences of writers in our country? And my parent and my two brothers told me, you know, like we don't have enough to eat. You should uh, study hard and be a doctor or a teacher 
or you know have a job that can earn money and help parents so i yeah so i listened to them and i went on and started business and i was um i was making a good career in business but my dream was always to write and i always loved to read and it was um, only in 2006 that um, no 2008 that I returned to my writing dream. And because I started translating Vietnamese, because I love the Vietnamese language so much that I started translating Vietnamese poetry into English. And I loved working with the two languages. So one day I thought, let me write um, you know, a book in English. <laughs> so I started <laughs> writing it. And, you know, and there were so many lonely moments. And I quit my full-time job to be able to write this book. But wow. then I thought, uh, yeah, so I took a big risk, right? And then I thought, but who's going to read this book, you know, uh, because my English isn't good enough and I had to use the dictionary throughout the process. So, I mean, for this book to be highly praised, um, you know, um, by, by the media and loved by readers, it's just the greatest gift. I mean, I'm still stunned by it and... I have so much to learn and every day I'm still learning English words and, you know, I still have a lot to learn as a writer and this is just the beginning and I just want to thank you for being here for me from the very beginning. Thank you so much. Well, so I'm going to ask some of the questions that I pose to all the authors that um, are in the group. Um, where did the idea for your book come from? So, you know, I, um, both of my grandmothers had died before I was born. So growing up, I was so jealous of my friends who had a grandma to tell them stories. So I told myself one day I'm going to write a book um, with a grandmother in it so that I can have a grandmother. And, you know, and, um, and I, um, because I was born in the north of Vietnam and grew up in the south, I saw... I experienced the complexity of the Vietnamese history and I wanted to write a book that has that places the Vietnamese people in the center of it and it would document the um, historical moments of Vietnam but I didn't know how to open the key to that world of stories until one day in 2012 when I was traveling in a car with a Vietnamese friend. So I, it was in Man Manila in the Philippines. We were going to a self-defense class, a kickbox chop, <laughs> kickbox chop, which appears in the book, right? Uh -huh. So um, so I made up that that story because I was learning self-defense and kickbox chop from my master. So I, I created, you know, the story in, in the novel. But I was um, asking, I was start, uh, traveling with one of uh, my friends to that class. And so I asked him what, uh, where he was doing the war. And he told me in 1972 when Hanoi was born, he was living with his grandmother in Hanoi. His, both of his parents had gone to Russia and his grandma protected him from the bombs. So he, you know, um, and he said more than 20 years after the war, um, he got a job with an international organization and he was sent on an overseas mission. He got, he got onto the plane and um, he heard the plane engine. He was so, he freaked out. He just, he came back immediately to the scene of bombing in 1972 when B-52 bombers were like bombing Hanoi. And he was so scared that he was screaming. He was trying to get out of the plane so you see the trauma of war really affected the people i was so moved by the story by his uh, story that that night after you know i had come home from the self-defense class i cooked my kids dinner fed them and put them to bed and his story stayed with me and it was like i remember it was like nine o'clock in the morning so i sat down at my writing desk and I, I googled, you know, the bombing of Hanoi in 1972, and you can still hear the audio broadcast of the sirens. And I was so so moved, and so I um I I started to write 2,000 words, and that would become the first um, chapter of the Mountain Sing. And 
the first chapter you know uh, read on the white rains um, in the novel uh, in in the mountain scene i wrote that night um, mostly most of it has stayed in the novel wow um, yeah. <clears throat> so how long did it take you to finish the book so it took me um seven years all together to write and edit uh, but but I think the research process took me my whole life, you know, for my, I wrote it with every cell of my body, with all the experience I had and, you know, with the interviews that I did with hundreds of people from the north to the south of Vietnam, with overseas, you know, with Vietnamese who live outside of Vietnam, with veterans of both sides, you know. I, I was um, very ambitious. I wanted to document as um, many people's experiences as possible. So, you know, why this novel is in, inspired by my family's stories, um, it also reflects many uh, Vietnamese families' experiences. And that um, is what brings me to, I, I invited a friend that I went to, um, I went to Goucher College to get my MFA in creative nonfiction. And Lee Wen um, was also there at the same time. And oh. his thesis was about um, his family and himself. He was in Vietnam and coming to America. And so I thought it would be very interesting and give us a lot of insight into your book if I brought Lee in to interview you and ask you some questions, in addition to the questions that people are gonna be asking from our group. So at this point, I'm gonna go away and Lee is gonna come in. So I will see you at the I'm very so, end. I'm so excited that Lee is interviewing me because I've seen his comments um, on the discussion, you know, his comments answering the discussion questions. And, uh, you know, for, for Vietnamese, um, whose families have experienced a lot of historical events in Vietnam, we lived it. This is our common history. So I think um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion with Lee. All right. All right. So Lee's going to be coming in, hopefully. <laughs> there he is. Hi, Lee. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, uh, I had to make sure that I wasn't picking my nose or anything before the screen starts. So <laughs> don't cut face. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, as Pamela mentioned, we went to school together. Um, I got my MFA in creative writing, um, and so mm -hmm. when I read this book, and actually when the book was chosen, it really resonated with me. Uh, you know, my family, very you know, as, as Gray Mike just beautifully said, we have a common history. Um, I came here when I was three, uh, so it's I pretty much grew up in America. But um, my, I'm very, very close to my family, especially my parents. I was fortunate to know mm -hmm. my grandmother. She came over with mm -hmm. us to the United States, so you know that was that was uh, I was very fortunate that I could. So, uh, with that being said, I'm going to ask uh, some questions from like just you know from um, a, a refugee point of view to Kwe Mai, uh, yeah. so that we can have that discussion, but. Feel free to definitely ask questions on your comments. I, I will see them and then we will then have a discussion with that. Uh, this is gonna be a very organic conversation that we're gonna have. Um, please excuse me if I sometimes say some Vietnamese words uh, that are like in art in the, in the Vietnamese language so that it just a, it's just a natural habit. So uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Quay Mai. Um, so first question I'm gonna ask you, like I think you already mentioned it, but maybe I know a lot of people were asking about it. Um, can you tell us, like you already said that English isn't your first language, uh, mm. so obviously Vietnamese. So first mm. of all, how did you did learn English? You went to school, did you have tutors? How did you first learn the English language? That's a great question. So um, actually, you know, I, I grew up in, um, in the rural area of Vietnam. So first, uh, the village where I was born, Ning Bing, didn't have any didn't have anyone who could speak English actually. So when I moved to the south of Vietnam in Bạc Liêu, my school didn't have any English teacher. So then one day, uh, my my brother came home, you know, uh, with uh, with some notes, and he started uh, 
to teach uh, me English because he said, you know, we all need to learn English and English is the key to open the world. And then he was teaching me this word and he pointed at it and he said, uh, skula, uh, circu, circula, <laughs> because circu means <laughs> something really <laughs> naughty in Vietnamese. So I was laughing so much. So Wait, then why, he why was did, so Why did you tell people what that means? <laughs> So go means to touch a male's uh, genital. <laughs> so I was like, oh, so I was laughing so much. So um, then I, you know, I could not, um, you know, uh, repeat after him anymore. And he was so upset. And only much later that I realized he was teaching me the worst school, school, because, you know, in Vietnamese, we don't have the L at the end so he was saying circula so instead of school he said circula so so that was a very memorable experience so i was very interested i became really interested in the english language then but i had no chance of uh, learning it until one day there's a um, kind teacher who came to my hometown and he decided to open a free english class mm -hmm for children who, you know, for children who are very poor. And at that time, you know, I was selling cigarettes and stuff on the street. I was working on the rice field. I mean, outside the school hours, I was working all the time. So I qualified for his class. So he's, he's just an unbelievable teacher. He's very kind. And we, we didn't know how to pronounce, you know, English words because at that time there was no internet or anything. So we just, um, we learned mainly, you know, by, uh, by studying by heart or by writing. So, um, and learning words by heart. And um, so, so, you know, like when I got the scholarship later to Australia, hardly anyone could understand me because I couldn't pronounce um, the Vietnamese word, uh, the English words. But, um, but I was fascinated with, uh, with the English language because, first of all, you know, when I, um, when I started to know more English, I could read more. And I think by reading, I, I learned so much about um, other pe people's point of view and, and, you know, literature really opened the door to the world for me. That's a great story. I, I love that. Um, so in writing <laughs> The Mountain Sings, um, how was your process in writing it? Did you first write it in Vietnamese and thought about it in Vietnamese? You know, sometimes we think in Vietnamese and then we translate it into English sometimes. Yeah. Or, you know, for English speakers, when, you know, I'm speaking Vietnamese or I'm speaking French, sometimes I think it in English and then I translate it. How was that process for you? Did you have to first write it in Vietnamese and then translate it? Or were you able just to freely write it in English? Um, it was, I wrote it, um, in English, but with the mindset of, um, someone who wants to put, preserve the Vietnamese essence mm. of her writing. So I wanted my characters to act and to think like Vietnamese, mm. right? So that's why I brought in a lot of proverbs, a lot of Vietnamese sayings, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, Vietnamese food, Vietnamese poetry, Vietnamese landscape. Um, so, but I had to use a lot, uh, um, you know, the, the, the dictionary because I wanted to, because, you know, the, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is that I have read a lot of Vietnam War literature and um, in English and most of the novels about the Vietnam War have Vietnamese people as the background or, you know, as people who don't need to speak or if we speak, we sound very simple and naive and, and seem simple and naive. And so I wanted to create it, to create, you know, a story with complexity of Vietnamese people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and my vocabulary wasn't sufficient. So a lot of the time I had to use the, the English dictionary. So I, because my experience uh, working as a translator really helped. I mean, for years, mm -hmm. I had translated Vietnamese poetry into English mm -hmm. and also the work of American veterans mm -hmm. into Vietnamese. I need to tell you this story why I, I mean, I first came to the state in 2008. 
um, you know, and so I, um, I arrived in Washington, D.C., um, and my husband brought me to the Vietnam War, Vietnam Veteran Memo Memorial. It was 2008, and I refused to go in. I, I told myself I could not honor, you know, uh, American soldiers who had contributed how, regardless of how small, to the devastation of the war, which I directly witnessed. But later, my husband mm -hmm. convinced me to go in, and at the foot of the war, I, I saw letters of children of these veterans who wrote to them. And I read the letters, and I stood there, and I was crying. And for the first time, I learned the, the humanity of the other side, you know, of the people whom I used to consider my enemy. So after that trip, I started reading a lot of literature by, mm. um, by American veterans who fought in Vietnam, and I decided to translate their mm. work into Vietnamese and introduce to Vietnamese people. And it was a very moving um, process because I remember facilitating um, um, a poetry reading mm. um, between American veterans and, and Vietnamese veterans in Vietnam. Mm. And some of the veterans, you know, didn't yeah. go back to Vietnam yeah. for like, for so many years. They, yeah. you know, they, one of them told me, I, for, for so many years, I thought if I went back to Vietnam, someone would run after me on the street and stab me with a knife. Mm -hmm. And he was crying to me and he said, mm -hmm. why are Vietnamese people so kind and so mm -hmm. forgiving? But, you know, I think all of us want to move on and, and you know, and um, reconcile. But I think the difficulty relating to the war is that... Um, Reconciliation, reconciliation is very difficult among Vietnamese people. They are still, whereas a lot of American veterans have returned to Vietnam, there are Vietnamese in the States who have not been back to Vietnam and the older generation even tell their kids not to return. Yeah. So I, this is a difficult subject, but I wanted to write about it. That's why I, I place the Vietnamese people in the center of the book, in the hope that we talk to each other more. And right. it's amazing that I talked to you, Lee, today, because you, your family is like from the South, right? You yeah. move from North to South, and I'm from the North. So right. if the war continued, we could have been each other's enemies. So this, um, this conversation is really amazing. Yeah, the one, I, the, that's why I think that reading your book, um, it just brought back... So I had like a, I, I had so many discussions with my mom and my parents about their journey, about their experience. Um, what we call Nambo, which is like the when they when they trans when they came from Hanoi down to Saigon, thousands upon uh, Northerners went down to Saigon during this time mm -hmm. to escape um, and to mm -hmm. to to, be, to go to the south south uh, Saigon, yeah. Vietnam because it was free and it was democratic and mm -hmm. and everything. Um, so your it's, it's so this book was just so beautifully brought back so many memories of my mom and had the discussion with me and I was too young I don't remember mm -hmm. but I but just like you said I remember when I went back to um, to Hanoi for the first time and Lang Bako so so uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh um, grave is there and yes. it took it was me, only, uh, yeah yeah it took me a long time because my relatives oh you should go see you should mm. go see them and i had all this resentment i had all this anger yeah to not go because i felt like mm. i was um i you know i felt all this anger but i did i did go and it was it was a good experience for me to go very similar to you with the memorial with the war memorial mm. it's just a reverse mm -hmm. you know so i'm glad yeah. to share that experience so um that's mm. great um, so if you see me typing, I'm trying to type down. I'm trying to write the questions people are asking. My people are writing questions, <laughs> so I'm I, I'm going to make sure that I um I answer. I'll ask those questions first before my questions. Um, I I'm so glad you went back to Vietnam. Yeah, actually, yeah. you know, we we have to differentiate um between between a political regi regime and the country, right? Yeah. 
Yes. This country yeah. Vietnam is always there for Vietnamese yeah. people to come back to. I think it's our homeland. You know, mm -hmm. you have your home in the states, but you have a second home. So you yeah, like. Yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> this, I mean, this may be controversial, but I always people. People always ask me, oh, you know, are you Vietnamese American? I, I always say I'm a Vietnamese living in America. Um, <laughs> I know, it's just because that's how I view myself. I, I view myself as Vietnamese. That's my cultural, that's my heritage. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Because that's, you know. That's me. So that's how I always view myself. But uh, let me get you one question here. Um, so will this, will this book be published in Vietnam, in Vietnamese? So actually, um, that's a great question. Um, so my publisher uh, offered to buy World Ride, oh. but I told my agent, um, I want to keep the Vietnamese right because when the time is right, I need to translate it myself uh, because oh. um, um, uh, I think it's um, in Vietnam, there are issues with censorship. Um, so, you know, uh, most I mean, this is one of the reasons I didn't write a book in Vietnamese. If I had a choice, I could have written this in Vietnamese. But I knew, um, you know, the discussion about the land reform or, quite a, or the conflict between North and South of Vietnam are still very much censored, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, so publishers in Vietnam, you know, when they receive a manuscript, they always look at uh, politically sensitive issues and they want to edit it, cut it, you know, they want to censor certain parts. I want this book to be published at its ease. I don't, I don't want any censorship. So at the moment, I think it could be difficult for it to appear in whole. Mm -hmm. If I would cut out a large chunk of the text or something, yeah. so but I'm not... If you, if you translate it to Vietnamese, what... How do you think that the many people would receive the book? Would they, would they enjoy it? Would they not? Because you're right, it's a very sensitive topic. Mm. So, how would you think the reception would be? I think I think people would be fascinated. Um, you know, um, because I think these are stories that people know, right? But uh, people know about it, and people talk about it in private. But in, I think there should be a, la a larger discussion. And I think the purpose of literature is to reflect the history of the people, right? And, and I mean, my book is about the human fate and the survival of the Vietnamese people through the turbulence of our history. Mm. And, and so it's, um, I hope that one day soon it can be published. I mean, I, I received so many... Um, you know, comments from, from readers like, when are you going to have this book in Vietnamese? We want to read it. And so many media agencies in Vietnam too, they want to interview me, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm just like, uh, wait until it's in Vietnamese, you know, <laughs> because I don't want to promote it in Vietnamese media right. at the moment uh, because I don't want to get anyone into trouble. Right, um, right. It can be uh, it can be very sensitive. So right. so I just yeah. want to be careful. Um okay. yeah so so it's it's a complicated situation yeah. but right. I was compelled to write. Um you know like in the book um I quoted the poetry line of Phung Quan. Um, mm -hmm. you know it's difficult it's to different. be a writer walking right. on the path of Ooh, yes. You know. Yeah. All right. Another question that people uh, asked if that was good questions are so are the books that Hun, your character, reads in the book, are, were they the same books that you read when you were growing up or when you were learning how to Eng read English? Were they the same books? Yeah, most of them are the same books. Like, you know, uh, Zen Man Fuluki, Diary of the mm -hmm. Cricket, is yeah. like, I read that book. So, you know, I need to tell you that my uh, hometown didn't have a library. So we didn't have money to buy books either. So, you know, but I, my parents um, had a, our most precious uh, thing in the house was a bookshelf that my father built himself from mm. bamboo. And uh, from whatever money we had, we bought books. But, you know, of course, there were not enough books. So I, I you know, um, borrowed from everyone, you know, all the books that they could lend me. So one of my favorite books was the Diary of the Cricket. And 
you know, and uh, and 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 the other books that I mentioned in 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 the story, you know, they led me to travel to understand the world, and I brought some of them <laughs> into the in, in, into the novel. That's great. Thank um, you for the great question. <laughs> so I so one good question for, from that, if you don't mind asking, so. I know growing up, like my parents grew up in a very rural area, just like you, there was like no English school, no anything. My mom received very, very little education. Um, in mm. Vietnam, I don't know if it's, it's definitely changed now, but back then women didn't receive mm. education. Men, my dad received more education than my mom did. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> so you just mentioned that like your father and your family bought books. That's usually, that's not, I mean, is, is that, was that common? I mean, that's usually not very common, right? And, and why did, how did no. they encourage you to learn? How did, how did your family become so, like, encourage you? I know you just said that, you know, they wanted you to, to, to do another profession, but they allowed you mm -hmm. to read. That's usually not yeah. common. So, so my pair, I'm very lucky that my, uh, so my parents were both uh, teachers and farmers. Oh. Because they were teachers, they really valued the the you know um they really value education. But actually, my in my whole village uh, in the north of Vietnam where I was born, um there was no one who could enter university. So mm -hmm. my father dreamt that one day his three kids could go to university. Mm -hmm. So he that's one of the reason he uprooted us from our small village and moved to the south because he said, uh -huh. you know, education, it, it, there would be more chances for us to enter university. So he always, regardless of how, how hard we work, but they always made us study, <laughs> you know, in the, in the, you know, like, um, so my, I want to tell you the story of my parents' sacrifice. So my my pair my uh, you know um I grew up during the time of the subsidized economy, so you know we were allowed uh, stamp booklets, so you could only buy certain um, amount of material like cloth to make clothes. Oh. So my so my mother only had like three sets of pens. But because I grew, uh, I grew up in Bạc Liêu town, and there were zillions of mosquitoes, so she cut one of her pens to sew to sew up the uh, cloth booth, you know, for my um, brothers and I to wear, so mosquitoes would not bite us, mm -hmm. so we could study, you know, at night, because we did not have electricity at that time, mm -hmm. no fan to chase away mosquitoes, so we just had oil lamp we sit at the table with our feet in the dark so we had the, my mother's you know cloth booth you know um made of her pet cut pen so mosquitoes would not eat us <laughs> so, so great. you know oh, that's so you're yeah. that's such an amazing that's, that's to have parents and like i say that i think that that's not common in vietnam back then for mm. you know for, especially if you're in rural areas um mm. they want you know just because it's about survival um yes it's, 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 so you want to do you, your parents and the family want you to do stuff that can survive yes Reading, and, and yeah. yeah but but i need to tell you that my parents always you know my their priority is for me to find a good husband <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so I was told all the time by the neighbors, like, don't study so much. Yes. You know, the men don't want women who, who know more than them. Yes. So don't study so much. Yes. And my parents' dream was for me to become, you know, like um, a secondary school teacher, yeah. you know, and find a husband and settle down, have a, you know, like cozy family. <laughs> so that was their dream. So it was just by chance that I got the scholarship to mm. Australia mm. because, you know, I studied, you know, at that time, um, I had no choice but to study mm. um, just so that I could get a small scholarship from my university. So I studied day and night and then luckily I got the scholarship to Australia. So it was really lucky. Well, we were lucky. We we're lucky that you got that, that, that scholarship because, you know, we were able to read your book. So um, we're happy that you Thank got you. that. Um, so one of the other question I asked was that, uh, so for me, it was really nice to, uh, to read, um, and you put like different names of the, of your characters, but the one thing I love is that you explain the meanings of the names. 
which in Vietnam, yeah. our names mean a lot to us. It's it's it, it, yeah. it, it, it's it's not just random names. We mm -hmm. the names that we that parents give to our children they mean something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, so you know so why did you why did you feel like you had to explain that in the book and and also what does your name mean? Mm. Thank you. So for the great question. So um, you know um, the way Vietnamese name our children reflect deeply our culture, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I think I was watching the old, um, the interview from Ocean Vuong recently. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you all need to read his book yeah, if you haven't on Earth. We're briefly gorgeous. He's so brilliant. And he said that in, in, in Vietnam, you know, um, a lot of Vietnamese na use nature as... Mm -hmm to name their kids, yeah? yeah. So, uh, for example, his name means Ocean. Right. Um, ocean actually means Mr. Hai in the book. <laughs> yeah, that's you know? right. Mr. Hai. So, uh, Ocean Vuong, his, mean, his name, his Vietnamese name is Hai, yeah, but he translates it into uh, Ocean. So, so I, I explain the meaning of the names to reflect, you know, the complexity of our language. Like uh, Mrs. Tu means refined beauty. Mm -hmm. So Tu, I wanted to keep the tonal mark because Tu, T U. Uh, if Tu, if you don't use any tonal mark, Tu means to become a monk. Tu, Tu means prison. <laughs> tu means refined beauty. Tu means to concentrate. Tu means uh, okay. a cabinet yeah. closet. Uh, yeah, uh, tư means uh, tư means number four. Mm -hmm. Tư means to die or death. Yeah. So so if you don't have the tonal mark, you can have tu 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 tư 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 tư. So many different meanings, and they are you know they can go very far away from each other. So that's why I needed to have the tonal mark, and also to add the meaning to to deepen, you know, the reader's experience into the Vietnamese culture. Uh, so for so for my name, so actually my my main name is Quê. So my parents, Quê means cinnamon with the tonal mark. Quê, this means cinnamon. Um, yeah. um, so my, so without the tonal mark, it would mean a stick. Quê, <laughs> it would mean a stick or uh, or if you add another tonal mark, it means queer, means invalid or disabled. <laughs> so, so I wanted to be queer means cinnamon. Mm -hmm. So my, so my parents uh, named me uh, um, named. Uh, there are three children, three ingredients of the Vietnamese medicine. So my brother is named Ha, mm -hmm. which is like a a, um, a root of a um, medicinal plant. Uh, my middle brother is named Sam. Uh, which means ginseng, ginseng, you know. Uh, and and my main name is Kue, uh, means uh, cinnamon. So three of our uh, our three names combined mm. to make uh, the Vietnamese traditional medicine. So they their wish is that for us to always stay healthy. Wow. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah, my parents were in that. Well, my parents did. But they just named me. There's a famous road in uh, Saigon called Đường Công Lý. Đường Công Lý, ah. That's my name. Oh, no, no. Công Lý, your name means justice. Justice, I know. I, I always say that, right. Công Lý means justice, like right, like doing right. Like Công Lý is like, yes. but I was just, I always, right. I always joke that I was named off a street, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm, thank you for sharing that. What, wow, that, what, what great insight to have your, um, your, your, uh, your names, your family. That's really good. Um, yes. So one of the things that that people are here, I think it was a good question here. Was, so uh, Jennifer asked, like, uh, she loved how you, the Vietnamese proverbs were used. Um, how did you get to choose what proverbs you <laughs> use and what not to? Because that was actually a question I had too, was how did you get to choose what proverbs you use and you didn't use? Hi, Jennifer. Thank you for the comment. I love your book. I'm so excited to finish. I have started reading Jennifer's book and, uh, you know, it's brilliant. So, so 
yeah, I'm really excited to share the thought about Jennifer's um, novel very soon. So yeah, so uh, Vietnamese proverbs are just a part of my life. Um, you know, um, I I grew up with proverbs all around me, so they they are at the back of my mind. So for example, you know, if uh, um, if, if if some people there is some bad thing to me, and they would think, and I would think, trời có mắt, heaven uh, has eyes, you know. So I don't have to do anything to the person because you know heaven will ensure justice, you know. So it's the proverbs are at the back of my mind. Actually, in the original manuscript, I use a lot more proverbs. <laughs> Uh, but um, you know, I think we had to cut the word word count. So you know, the the uh, my agent sold the manuscript when the um, when the word count was two hundred and nearly a hundred and thirty thousand words, and my editor asked me to cut it down and also added some more scenes. Uh, mm. So I had to cut a lot of things, and I I, I think um, you know. It was good to select certain proverbs and not to use too much. Um, and I selected those which are, um, you know, like representative of the Vietnamese culture. For example, the proverb mưa dầm thấm lâu. Mm. Um, I love that one. Uh, oh, yeah, it's so, so beautiful. Uh, yeah, soft, uh, soft rain, uh, soft rain penetrates the earth better than a storm. Right, so that's about the value of patience of of working on something every day, and I I chose it because Grandma Zioland is a farmer and she works with with the land and the soil. And Vietnam is a country of of agriculture, you know. So I wanted to use proverbs which are very like uh, Vietnamese, you know. Great. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, so another question I had was really good was uh, actually Susanna asked this. Um, about the beheading of the father when he was going to yeah. Hanoi. Um, yes. so it was, it was, it was pretty grisly. It was, it was pretty horrific. Can you explain that? Can you explain how you got to that yeah. scenario, how you got to that, that storyline? Um, so actually, um, when I researched about the, um, the Indochina war in Vietnam and the occupation of, of the Japanese troops, I found a lot of horrific stories. Um, in real life, you know, like um, the Jap Japanese army, when they were in, in Asia, they committed a lot of atrocities in China, the Philippines, Vietnam, um, Korea. So I wanted to bring some of that horror in, into the book. And, you know, like once you have witnessed war, you see that it's much worse than you can ever describe it, you know. So uh, so I had res uh, hesitation in describing that scene. Yeah. Uh, but I thought, you know, when we talk about war, we have to confront it directly so that we can promote peace. You know, as a child growing up, I was sure that that humans would not wage another war on Earth. I was so sure. I saw so many people uh, who had lost their relatives, uh, so many people without uh, limbs, you know, so many people who had gone, um, you know, like... Um, crazy because of of the war's impact and um and i want and i was sure we would never wage another war on earth but as a child i was naive and mm -hmm. and i wrote it with with a really um a strong wish that you know that there would be no other war mm -hmm. and humans should love each other more and we should not uh, you know, use violence against each other because there's this circle of violence, you know, when you inflict violence onto another culture, there will be revenge. And I don't know when it will stop, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so so I want to highlight mm -hmm. the impact of wars on different generations. Right. It does not just kill people. Right. It will destroy cultures, societies, families yeah. for generations to come yeah um yeah um so, so one question i had was that um 
So, let me think like that. Uh, is it hard for females to be writers in Vietnam? I know that we have so many female, amazing female <laughs> authors on in this in this club and in this book. So, what is your journey as a female author in Vietnam, as a Vietnamese female author? You know, in a very patriarchal mm -hmm. society, still Vietnam is still very yeah. patriarchal. How yes. is that? How do you combat that? How do you how do you encourage other you know aspiring female authors you know in Vietnam or, or otherwise when they meet you that are in kind of like patriarchal societies mm -hmm. that don't encourage women to become authors? How do you how do you encourage that? How do you grow that? Actually, that's a great question because I remember when I first started to become a writer, I I I went to a meeting and I sat down next to um an um. A, a Vietnamese man who's a writer, and then he asked me, "Do you know who I am?" <laughs> and I said, "I'm, uh, I'm sorry, you know, because there's so many writers in Vietnam." And then he said, uh, "You uh, women, you think that you?" Um, he said, "You, you women are uh, bamboos without roots. Uh -huh. You can't, be, you know, you can't become a writer, you know." If you don't know who I am, so later he read me some of his poetry. I knew his poetry, I knew his name, but you know, I didn't, I didn't know his face. So I, I knew his poems, you know. But so, so like it was a big shock. But I actually, you know, um, the Vietnamese literary landscape is still dominated by male writers mm -hmm. um, who are older. Mm -hmm. So when there's emerging Vietnamese female voice and people say, hang on, what is she doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, yeah, I mean, so I have had quite a few uh, funny experiences, you know, because like in Vietnam, people still think that it's not a real job to become a writer. Right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. because, you know, writer sh writing should be a hobby because everybody writes. You know, so so I mean, um, so so it's um so for 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 women to be writers, we have to work double hard. Mm. We have to overcome challenges and prejudices. We we need to be, you know, our voices need to be heard. I mean, because when it comes to to serious issues, they still think the men are more knowledgeable. Right, and here I am, uh, a second generation, you know, who was who did not experience the war. The veterans may think, "Who is she to write about the war? She did not experience it, and she is a woman. Right. We fought in the war. We experience it, right. you know. What right does she have to write about it? Right. So there could be there has been resistance, but you know, as a writer, you have to be fearless. You have to believe in yourself. And I mean, you know, the feedback from writers has been just amazing. It gives me a lot of, a lot more confidence, inspiration to continue to create because I think in the end, it's the matter of, of research, serious research and imagination. You so know, writers you have... So, with, so if you get to give advice for, you know, mm. aspiring writers, how did your process from going from a, a thought, I'm going to write this book about my, you know, I'm going to write this book. How do you go from mm. that to then getting mm. it published to then getting it to think, how did you go about that? How did you find your voice? How did you find that, that platform and that avenue to get published? Mm. You know, I, um, I used to be a documentary filmmaker. Mm. And a, um, a film producer used to uh, told me once, you can only make a good film if your hands tremble behind the camera. Ah. <laughs> so the trick for being for writing a great story, I think, is you have to be moved by it. You have to feel it. You have to live it. You have to experience it. You know, um, when I wrote the mountain sing, I I cried a lot. I because I felt so connected to my characters. I experienced all the trauma they went through, mm. to the deepest of their trauma, to the tiny detail. Um, and I I you know, and you have to have that strong feeling. But it's also hard work, discipline, 
you know, I use when I work on the book, I woke up at four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning uh, when the house was quiet because my kids were little and, you know, so I wanted some quiet moments. So I woke up really early and, you know, I mean, being a writer, work, um, working from home, their expectations from your friends, you know, let's go for coffee or, or lunch. I, I turned them down. I was like, quite disciplined you know i i didn't accept a lot of invitations and you need to read a lot as a writer you know there's no better teacher than reading uh, you know i i read in vietnamese and english um i i read for pleasure but also for for the art of writing because for for each writer you can learn so much what was your most uh, influential book to help you with this this, this book, what, what book that you read that was the best one? You're going, oh gosh, that's what I want to use to model my book after. Mm, actually, I wanted to create something unique. Mm. Um, so, um, so I did not uh, model after any book. Mm. But I must say that um, I love uh, Amy Tan's voice. Mm. Yeah, The Kitchen God's Wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love that novel because mm -hmm. you know Amy Tan is so incredible in her creation of of the uh, the you know a Chinese uh, American voices you know the 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 Chinese people sound very Chinese American in the book and the grandma you know or or, or, or the older generations sound really authentic in that book so I love the way she creates you know certain uh, like different generations of women in mm. her in her story so i love her books and i read them and i also read a lot of uh, literature by um by vietnamese americans you know like ocean vuong viet thanh nguyen um andrew x farm um you know catfish. In, in, that was like catfish and mandela yeah, catfish. I need to tell you. I love that one. Catfish in Mandela was one of the first books from um, Vietnamese American writers that I read. Oh. And after, and and I after I read it, it was I think it was in two thousand and six when I wrote. Uh, or no, two thousand and two when I read that book. I I read the first ten pages and I put it away. I said this is not true. Because it dealt with the re-education camps in Vietnam. It does. And, you know, because, and I, th I said, this is not true. Yes. Um, yes. So I put it aside, but it's now one of my most favorite books. Yeah. Because it um, is so poetic, yeah. it's painful, but yeah. it's so personal. Um, Catfish and Mandala, if you haven't read it, you should. Okay. So you, you could see that books really open extended my horizon yeah. i wouldn't have been here without without reading i yes. mean i read i read books from all over the world and i i wanted to read books of people who have different experiences than me mm -hmm. you know like um and you can learn so much yep. with reading so i think i'll just I'll, i know we have a couple of minutes more minutes here so i'm gonna ask you a, a couple of questions here so is there a sequel what are your future plans here what's what's the next step <laughs> for you so you know, there have been uh, right. Uh, there have been readers who said, you know, I want to know what happens to Hương afterwards, you right. know, and also, uh, you know, the other relatives of Hương and what happened to them, mm -hmm. and uh, and and about the father um, and so on. So people have been like asking, mm -hmm. is there a sequel? I haven't thought, you know, I haven't thought about a sequel yet. But uh, maybe, maybe. But uh, the good news is that I have uh, finished my second novel in English. Oh. Um, so this this um, this book is, is this novel is also about the uh, consequences of the Vietnam War. It is more directly related to the um, the Amer um, American experiences, in the sense that the book uh, brings to life stories about Americans the children of American soldiers and Vietnamese women. So um, throughout my research, I found out that 100,000 of Americans were born into the Vietnam War and they were abandoned, abused. And some of them, you know, most of them managed to 
go to the U.S. under the American Homecoming program. But can you believe it? Uh, some of them, you know, had uh, had been sent back to Vietnam recently. Yeah. Uh, so that's the sad reality. Yeah, I think that um, in Vietnamese culture, it's um, we call lai mei e or, or 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 whatever it's going to be. It's it's very it's a different culture for for them because you're you're like you're you're yes. It's 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 hard for those children or those those citizens because they're not viewed as completely 100% Vietnamese and and mm -hmm. it's very hard for them to adapt. But yeah, mm -hmm. even in the United States, we've had you know people who are no or that or mixed culture. It's tough. Mm. Yeah. So yes. that's, that's well. When is that going to come out? I don't know. I just sent it to my agent, and uh, it will take a long time. Book publication takes a long time in the u.s um but uh, but i'm really excited about it and my 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 biggest um, challenge next this month is i need to submit my phd thesis <laughs> and to defend it and you know like i have so much going on at the moment with the book launch with everything i you know like i don't want to defend my thesis right now but i have to get it done so so i think it's it is also good, you know, to have certain deadlines and pressure, but yeah. it can be a lot. So this group has been amazing to me. I mean, I love your questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this. I so thoroughly got, love the book. I, you know, I, I couldn't stop reading it. Um, I'm glad for your success. And um, I think, I don't know, uh, Pam, I don't know if you want to join back on here or... Great, Mai, do you have anything else you want to say at the end? Um, oh, actually, I can I sing something Vietnamese? Oh, oh. I said I would reveal the secret, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I would reveal the secret. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't forget. The secret, if you read a Grandma Ziu Lan story, how she abandoned each child along the way, mm -hmm. um, actually, it's based on my uh, my friend's grandma's story, real life story. Mm -hmm. So during the land reform, uh, she was uh, pronounced, uh, um, you know, a landowner and faced a death sentence. So overnight, she had to um, leave, uh, flee, you know, with her uh, children, her many children. So the way to Hanoi was very long. So she had to leave her ch uh, each kid with a stranger. Yeah. And because she could know French in Hanoi, she worked with a French company mm -hmm. as their house servant. She was cleaning the house. And when, you know, the French uh, lost the battle of the Bin Phu, she was offered to go to Paris with them. But she refused. She didn't tell them why. But she didn't go so that she could go back and find her kids oh, wow. so oh. yeah so that's that's the you know that inspired uh you know grandma zilan's journey oh. so oh and yes and pamela do you have questions for me well i i don't have a question i have a gift for you i made you uh this is what i do for my other job i made you a box um uh, and I showed you a picture of it, but because I want you to sign my book, so I'm going to send this to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow, what a beautiful book. Wow, what a beautiful book. Oh, there, Thank you. There's the title and your name, so you can keep your first book safe on your shelf. Um, we are going to do a drawing. Your publisher, Algonquin, is giving away two books to one lucky uh, reader who took a picture with your book. So I'm going to go ahead and I have a I don't have a hat, but I put it in a bag. <laughs> so should I give it to one person or should I give one book to one person and another book to another? What should I do? I think separate. You can ask them. Do two. Do two. I'll do two. Okay. All right. Our first winner is Romy Arena. Romy, are you there? <laughs> Maybe not, but I will let her know. And then the books are Creatures by Chrissy Van Meters and Everywhere You Don't Belong by Gabriel Bump. And wow. this one, Gretchen Miller. 
Congratulations. 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 And then I want to thank you, Lee and Kwe Mai, for participating. This was an extremely wonderful talk. Um, if you, you haven't already, please buy uh, Kwe Mai's book. Um, write a review if you have read it, because that's what benefits these writers right now mm -hmm. is getting exposure. So if you have a Goodreads account, go on there and write a review or go on Amazon if you purchase it there or wherever you purchased it go on there and write a review and it could just be loved it terrific brilliant it doesn't have to be a Thank long you. involved <laughs> review um we are going to be picking our next book um for our may read um and so look for that post it's going to be later today and it'll have how we're going to pick the next book and it's going to be from all the official debut authors and you're actually going to write in your vote and then we're gonna narrow it down to three before we actually pick. So I wanna thank you again, both of you. This has been awesome. And thanks to the Passionistas Project for being yes. the technical support because if I had to learn one more thing, <laughs> I, I just don't have the brain capacity right now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, All you. Right. thank you so much, uh, Pamela, for creating this uh, wonderful book club. I want to thank every member out there who is giving support to authors during this very uh, difficult time. Your support gives us light. You are the pillar for us to lean on at this moment. Thank yeah. you so, so much. And thank you, Lee, for your brilliant interview questions and Amy and Nancy for, you know, being our technical ex expertise. <laughs> so I want to um, end with a Vietnamese song. Yes. Right? <laughs> Can Lee, can Lee sing along with oh, me? God, Don't go. <laughs> we didn't talk about we this didn't at all. Talk about this. <laughs> so what song do you know? <laughs> um, why don't we do a traditional song? Tell me a song that is... Um, Chống cơm, chống cơm. Chống cơm. Oh, you start singing it. Okay. Tình bằng có cái chung cơm Khi nay khéo phá ôi bụng mà nên buông Mỗi bụng mà nên buông Môn bay tăng đi con nít Môn bay tăng đi con nít Lối 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 sông ngon mới đi Tìm em nhớ thương ai <cười> đôi con mắt nó mới lìm dìm đôi con mắt nó mới lìm dìm môn bay tăng tình con nhìn <cười> so my, I, I don't know the, the words as much as hers but I love that song Chấm Cơm oh, I love it Chấm, yeah you know it's a it's a it's a um, fun song a fun that song. we sing during our happy time that's right, that's right. So, I hope I can uh, pass on some of uh, our happiness to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for attending this book chat, and it's, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.